Um, we were talking about finite state machines and sequential logic. Um, um, in a finite state machine, the current state is kept in a register, um, which a register is a um, multiple D flip-flops that are operated in parallel to create a multi-bit state. The number of states, or the number of bits, is the log base 2 of the number of states uh, of the state machine. The state machine, the, the states are the bubbles, and the arcs represent transitions. Um, we also, uh, let's see, there's a couple things we talked about with regard to flip-flops last time. There are synchronous and asynchronous uh, flip-flops, uh, sorry, uh, uh, flip-flops can have synchronous and asynchronous resets, rather. Um, reset is what allows you to start up a system and to put the finite state machine into a known state, a start state. Uh, so you, whatever the start state is, is you encode that as having uh, a state value of all zeros. So then when you reset all the flip-flops or the register that makes up the current state value that stores the current state, uh, that returns it back to the start state. Everyone with me? Make sense? Uh, synchronous uh, resets on the clock edge. Asynchronous resets uh, 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 in response to just the, the, the reset being asserted. Um, so finite state machines are comprised of three parts. There's the state register that holds the current state. Uh, that can be updated on the clock edge. So it's, it's updated um, every, uh, on every clock cycle, um, potentially. Uh, there is also combinational logic in there that forms the next state. So that's typically, in, in the book, they use uh, the prime. Like if, if the current state is Q, then the next state is Q prime, uh, which is a little confusing, because you might think of prime as also meaning complement, logical complement. But um, th there's some, some in, in they use that to, to denote next state. Uh, so don't, don't, don't get confused by that. There's also the output logic, which is also combinational logic that calculates the output of the finite state machine um, as a function of the current state, if it's a Moore machine, or of the current state and the input inputs, if it's a Mealy machine. Uh, so what does that mean? Why do we need output logic? Well, the current state, the state value, is sort of internal. It's only used internally. So the output logic is what translates the current state into some output that's usable by whoever's using the circuit, whoever's using the finite state machine. Does it make sense? It's like a translation. You're translating the current state value into, into the outputs. OK. <clears throat> yeah, here's, by the way, this is the prime, that prime notation I was talking about. S prime is the next state, and S is the current state. Uh, so um, don't let that confuse you. Um, then we went into an example. Um, I didn't realize it when I, on, on Monday, but the names of these streets are uh, academic and bravado. So the TA comes from uh, academic. That's the state of the traffic light on this academic street. And TB is the state uh, of the traffic light on bravado street. Um, and actually, Th those are the outputs of the FSM, L, L, A, L, B. Each one of those is two bits because you have to represent three possible values of green, yellow, and red. Right? Uh, so the current state is, is not necessarily, the current state is, 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 is translated into the outputs using the output logic. Everyone with me? Any questions about this? OK. Um, so this traffic light controller example, if you look at it from the top level, uh, you look at it in terms of its inputs and outputs, you've got a clock and a reset. Every FSM is going to have that. That's pretty typical. And then the inputs are shown here on the left, and the outputs on the uh, right. So actually, sorry, I, I have to correct myself. Um, TA is not the, the light. TA is whether there's traffic. That's the input. 
So TA is if there's traffic on academic, TB is if there's traffic on bravado. Sorry, uh, the LA and LB are the state of the lights, uh, what, what, what color the, light, the traffic light is. Okay, so we went through an example of that. Um, so um, this has four states. Now, from a design perspective, how do we know there's, there's four states? How do we arrive at that? Where does, why, why four? Uh, um, well, it's, it's, it has to do with the, the, the values. What are the valid values of the lights? Uh, and there's four valid configurations. There's uh, a green light on one of the two. Uh, or there's a, or or there's there could be a, a yellow light on one of the two, right? And then in each one of those cases, the light on the other street is red. So there's four possible configurations of the traffic lights at this intersection. Does that make sense? Now let's. What if we come up with another example? Let's say I, I mentioned last time that um, what if you were designing a a controller for a soda machine? Uh, how would that work? The, in that case, the states would represent how much money uh, the user had put in or how much money that was sort of a credit that needed to be returned in change. You guys with me? So for example, you could have a state like say, say you had a, a soda machine uh, that uh, would charge 25 cents uh, for, for a soda and uh, it can accept a nickel, dime, or quarter. So your input alphabet, uh, N, D, Q. And we'll assume that only one of those can be asserted at one time, right? Because you can only put one coin in at a time. And then the outputs would be uh, release, Release R, release the release a, a soda, right? Or uh, so let's say RS, and then RD for release a dime, for change, right? And release a nickel. Does it make sense? Okay. And so in that case, we'd start out with uh, like an idle state. That would be our reset. So we want to make sure that when we turn the Coke machine on, it, it goes to the reset state so it, it doesn't uh, mistakenly think there's money had, that had been inserted. Because a flip-flop will, will come up in a random configuration when you power it up. It'll, it'll come up with random data. So you need to have that reset to explicitly initialize uh, the state to zero, um, and that'll be our, our idle state. And then if a... Uh, at that point, we want to have an outgoing transition, three outgoing transitions, to represent um, three possible, well, actually, there's four. You know, if nothing happens, we have an, uh, a loop back. So if n, q, uh, sorry, n, d, and q are all zero, then we'll just stay in the idle state. If, uh, if we get a quarter, then we'll go into this state that I'll just call 25. And in here, We'll say release soda equals one. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of shorthand here. Um, I'm just going to put a Q on this transition that represents, you know, if Q is if Q is one. When you build this, when you build the state, uh, the, sorry, the uh, next state logic, the 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 truth table or the Carnot map, uh, you you have to also account. You, well, you have to, I guess, in this case. Um, this transition would be Q is 1 and D and Q are, I'm sorry, um, N and D are don't cares because it's impossible for, for us to put more than one coin in at a time, right? So the assumption here is that the clock is running at a sufficiently high speed that you, you wouldn't be able to put in you know, two quarters in one clock cycle or two coins in one clock cycle. You guys with me? Um, likewise, you can only release one coin per cycle. Uh, so if that happens, we, we'll come here and then just in the next cycle, we'll unconditionally transfer back to, to idle. Um, if you put in a dime, we'll go into a state called 10, and then we'll just sit there indefinitely uh, until another coin is put in. Um, 
And then if we put in a nickel, then we'll go into this state called 5, right? And in this case, RS, the default value for RS is 0. So we're going to assume that if, unless noted, RS, actually RS, RD, and RN are all, are all 0. You guys with me? Does that make sense? These are default values. This is going to become relevant in the next chapter when, when you write HDL for this stuff. You uh, generally will specify the default values, and then you only have to set outputs when they're needed, when they're not the defaults. OK? Um, so uh, let's see here. What am I missing? So if we go into 10, if we go into this state, then we have to have three transitions coming out of here. I could put a nickel in, in which case I would be at this 15 cent state. Um, I could put a dime in, in which case I'd be at this 20 state. Or I could put a quarter in, in which case I would be at a 35 state, right? So at this point, I can release a soda and I can release a, um, they're 25 cents, so I've got 10 cents of change, right? So I can release dime is one, and then I can go back to here. Make sense? And then if I'm, uh, if I'm over here at 20, um, I could put in a, uh, a, um, a, 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 a nickel, at which point I would be at 25 cents. But instead of adding a new state for that, I can reuse this other state, right? So if I, if I get a nickel, I can just reuse this state I already have for 25 cents. Does that make sense? Right, yes? Do those need three outputs? Yeah, there's, there's three outputs on, on all of these. But if I don't, if I don't give the output, if I don't actually set any output in the state, then it's assumed that it's 0, 0, 0. Right. Um, same thing with the loopbacks. I'm also going to assume that, like for example, if I put in a dime and then I walk away, uh, it's just going to stay in that state. And so there'll be a, like a sort of a, the, the state will register that it has 10 cents in it, but the, the, the user walked away and so it'll just stay there indefinitely. And so the next person that comes around will, will you know, get, get a free 10 cents, right, essentially. Uh, but, but the point, I'm not going to show the loop back, so that's sort of implied, right? Um, OK, so then let's see. If I have 20 cents, I put a nickel. I have 20, uh, sorry, 20. If I put a nickel, I get to 25, and it'll release the soda. Um, I could put a dime, and I'll get to 30, right? Uh, at which point, I can release the soda is 1, and release a nickel is 1, and then I go back to idle. Right? Um, and if I get a quarter, that's 20 plus 25. That'll give me to 45 cents. So I'll release the soda. I'll release a, let's see, if I'm at 45, I want to release, um, I want to take away 25 is the cost of soda. That gives me 20 cents that I have to give in change. So I have to release a dime. And then I have to go to another state, which I'll call credit 10, which I'll release another dime. And then I will go back to idle after that. Make sense? Um, and then let's see, does that cover that? That covers that state. OK, if I have 15, then I could put a quarter, which will get me to 40 cents, which is yet another state I have to add. If I get there, I'm going to release the soda. And then I got to release a, uh, let's see. If I release uh, that was 15 cents of change, so I got to release a dime and a nickel. If I release a nickel first, then that'll get me to this 10, in which case I can release a dime. You see what I mean? I, 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 um, you guys see that? Um, so the idea is if I, put a, if I put 15 cents in and then I put another quarter, that gives me to 40, I'll release the soda. And then I'll release a nickel of change, which will allow me to then transfer over to this 10 cent credit, releasing a dime. And then I go back to idle, right? Um, OK, let's see. What am I missing here? Um, that's a quarter. Um, if I'm in 15 and I get, a, uh, if I, get a, if I get a dime, now this is where things get a little messy. I can go to 25, and if I get a nickel, then I can go to 20. Uh, and then I'm at 5, and I get a quarter, I'll go to 30. Do I have a 30? Yeah. So quarter, um, dime is 15, 
and a nickel is 10. I think that's probably about, I think that's it, unless I'm missing some, I think I got all the transitions. All right? So there you go, Coke machine controller. <laughs> um, so how many states do I have? I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So I would need a four bit, at least four bits of state, four bit state register. Now I mentioned last time that sometimes, sometimes designers will generate state values that are using one hot encoding. So they actually, if you use one hot encoding, you need one bit for every state. So in that case, I'd have an 11 bit state register, but that's up to, that's up to whoever's implementing this in, as a circuit. You guys with me on that? But at a minimum, I need four bits. To, to be able to encode the state, right? Now you might say, well, how, how do you get 11? How, how do you know that it's 11 states? Well, actually, I didn't know that until I designed it. 11 states, rep 11 states is what's needed in order to represent every possible amount of money that someone could have put into the machine. And then in one case, I had this one state here where I had a, uh, a credit of 10 cents that I had to release. So that was a kind of an unexpected one that I put in. Uh, which happened because um, I could end up with, you know, uh, more money extra than I could release and change in one cycle. Does that make sense? So um, that's just another kind of another example. Oh, um, I, I won't carry all this way, th this whole thing all the way through. But if I were to, if I wanted to actually design this, I would have to then assign state values to each one of these. And then I'd have to build my next state table and then my output logic, right? And then at that point, I could, I could actually build this on a, on, a, on a breadboard, right? Or I could build it as a you know, digital logic circuit, or I could actually build it with uh, logic gates on a breadboard. OK. Um, so this is the example that I showed last time uh, for the traffic light controller. Uh, then we got to the timing diagram. Um, the timing diagram is uh, showing, this is, this is what uh, a simulator would produce if you were simulating this. Um, timing diagrams are very often used if you're reading through data sheets for, like, say, a memory chip or some um, uh, device that you're using to build a system. Uh, it is very often the case that you'll see timing diagrams listed in, in, in data sheets that, that, that show you how, uh, how, how a device is, is supposed to behave, uh, sequences of events. Um, in this case, it's showing you know, the reset causes the state to the current state to reset, which also um, also resets the um, next state to zero. But that was only indirectly. The reason why the next state got initialized to zero is because when I reset my current state, it just so happened that I had traffic at, um, I had traffic at Academic Boulevard, right, TA. And because that was one, when I reset, the next state was also initialized as zero. In other words, when I started the system up, my reset state said Academic Boulevard should come up as green initially. But if there was no traffic at that time, then I would have initialized a green light on Academic, but on the very next cycle, I would immediately have went to um, yellow, right? So my next state, if that, if that TA had been zero, my next state there would have been, T, would have been S1, right? Meaning that the uh, the lighted academic would only be would only be green for um, a very short amount of time, less than a cycle, and then it would it would go straight to yellow. You guys with me, right? So what's my point? My point is is that the reset resets the state, the current state. It does not necessarily reset the next state logic. The next state logic is going to snap into action um, as soon as you reset the state, and then it'll it's going to you know it's going to be also reflected in the current. Uh, inputs at that time. You guys with me? Okay. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, so what happened here was that we had traffic for a while at academic. Eventually, we don't have traffic. Now, notice here too that before, before we, before the traffic led a, led up at Academic Boulevard, we did get traffic at the other, the other street at, at Bravado, right? 
but it didn't matter because we, we, we wouldn't be able to switch state until the, the traffic at, at uh, academic stopped, at which point we were able to transition over to the yellow light and to the red at academic. Okay, any questions about this? If, if, any, if there's any confusion, uh, please, uh, please stop me. I'm going through this fast because uh, I'm just doing a review. Okay, um, okay, here's another example. This one is kind of strange. Aly Alyssa P. Hacker has a snail that crawls down a paper tape with ones and zeros on it, which is depicted here. The snail smiles whenever the last two digits it has crawled over are zero, one. Design a more and immediately finite state machines of the snail's brain. Well, this one's actually, um, a little simpler, I think. Um, although it's not quite as obvious how many states you have to put in for this one. Um, so this one starts out has your reset state. This bit represents whether the snail is smiling, the output, right? So the snail is not smiling. If I get a zero and a one, then I'll transition twice uh, to S, S1 and then S2 at which point the snail will be smiling because it saw a zero, one. Um, now the thing is about that is th there's no way that the snail could smile for two consecutive cycles because there's no way to get, there's no way to have the last two bits be zero and one twice in a row. So once, you, once, you, once the snail smiles, if the next character it says, sees is one, it has to go back to the start. But if it sees a zero, it goes back to this intermediate state, um, having seen a zero, right? You guys with me? Make sense? Okay, so this one's a little, a little trickier to construct. Uh, but the idea is that it's looking for a pattern. And so this S1 state represents a partial state of match of the pattern. I'm looking for zero, one. And if I'm in this state, it means I've seen zero and I'm looking to possibly see a one to complete the pattern. Or if I see another zero, I'm actually going to stay in that state. Because if I keep seeing zeros over and over again, I'm going to still exist in this state of having seen a partial match. You guys with me? So if I see zero, 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 I'm still going to be sort of hanging out in here waiting for, uh, waiting for a one, right? OK. Now that's a, that's a more state machine. Why do I know it's a more? because the outputs are in the states. A Mealy machine would have the output on the transitions. The problem is, is that I've already got the inputs on the transitions, right? So now we've got confusion because you have to put both the inputs and the outputs on the transitions. Does that make sense? So you put a slash, right? So if you have a Mealy machine, <clears throat> you say, um, I start out here, if I get a zero, I'll come to this state, right? And then if I get a one, instead of having to go to another state, I can, I can just output a one. Like so, in other words, this says that if I see a one, my next state logic is going to tell me to go back to this state. But at the same time, I'm going to just go ahead and output a one, right? So in other words, the next state logic, the, sorry, the output logic says if I'm in S0, I know I've seen a zero. But if I now see a 1, I'll output a 1 um, until I transition to S0. Does that make sense? So the, the, the idea is that I can, I can reduce the number of states by 1. Now the problem is with this that, is that with a Mealy machine, the outputs are asynchronous. The outputs can be, the outputs, like if I'm in S0, this is the part that's kind of, for me at least, was confusing. If I'm in S1 and I see a 0, I will set my next state to S1, right? But then if suddenly the snail changes its mind and says, oh, I saw a 1, it'll change the next state to 1 and the output to 0, right? Now the problem with that is that the next state, the next state is ignored until the clock cycle. You guys, like, like there's no, setting your next state to be something is, doesn't matter until I get to the clock edge, in which case I actually act on that next state. But the output logic is, is live. That's like a live, that's something that someone using the state machine would see the output, right? So what could possibly happen is if I'm in this state and I see a 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 
before the clock edge, then my output will be toggling along with the input, right? You guys with me? Now that's probably not going to happen in this case because I think the underlying assumption is that the snail only moves one slot per cycle. So that's probably not going to happen. But in theory, if the, if the snail had a broken camera or something, right, it might be, you know, the output might, would be allowed to sort of glitch out and, you know, change toggle up and down within one cycle, right? In other words, the outputs can change within a cycle. They don't wait till the next, till the clock edge as you would with a more machine. Does that make sense? Now, a couple things though. Mealy machines are not as commonly used as more machines because of this asynchronous nature of the outputs. In fact, the book, the book does not really focus very much on these Mealy machines. It mentions them, but most of this chapter is about more machines, especially because a big part of the chapter is on dynamic discipline, which is where you're trying to analyze the timing of sequential logic circuits, and it's difficult to analyze. Having a Mealy machine complicates timing analysis. You guys with me? Because of the, uh, the unpredictability of that output logic. So um, I just kind of give you some context. Okay, so here's the, <coughs> this is a, uh, um, and it, this is how to construct the, uh, the, the, the Moore style version of the state machine. Um, the uh, current state, uh, yeah, so the state encoding is here. I would have, this should be on the left probably, but um, because I have to figure out, I, I have to do this before I can do this. So this is kind of, these two tables are kind of switched. So before I do anything else, when I want to, if I want to build this thing, I need to figure out how I'm going to set up how I'm gonna, what, what values I'm going to assign to each of my three states, S0, S1, S2. So um, 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0 for the, the three state values. And then once I have this, then I could build my next state table. So if I'm in 0, 0, which is S0, and I get a 0, then what? Well, then I'm going to go to S1, right? So there's going to be a 0, 1, right? Um, if I'm in 0, 0, and I see a 1, then I'm going to stay in 0, 0. So this will be 0, 1, and 0, 0, right? And, and so on. Everyone see that? Does it make sense? So, so this table is, is just a, a, a truth table version of my, of my state diagram, with the exception being that I actually substitute in my encoded state values for each state. Right? Uh, another way to look at this, by the way, is the next state table has one row for every one of these arrows, for every one of these arcs, these transitions, edges, whatever you want to call them. Every one of these things has a row, is a, is a row in the next state table, right? Um, and, and, and this table is organized. The current state is where, where I'm coming from. So this is, this is the predecessor state. And the next state is that where I'm going to, so that's the successor state. So think of this as this is from and this is to, right? So if you go through your state diagram, you're going to put one row of the truth table for every arc in the state diagram. And you know, you're going to have rows that represent the bits of your from state and rows that represent your to state. And of course, your to state is the output. Any questions? Okay. Um, the output for this is pretty simple because I have uh, three states, and for each state I need to have my output, and I only have one output, which is Y, which is whether the snail is smiling or not. So just uh, in this case, there's only three rows, but problem is is that that you can't have three rows in a truth table. You got to have should be four rows here. But the fourth row would be for state 1, 1, which I never use. So that would be a don't care. You guys with me? So they should have added a, another, a fourth row for 1, 1, but the Y should be a don't care. Why? Because I don't care what Y is. I don't care what the output is because I don't ever expect the current state to be 1, 1. You guys with me on that? So then you can use that to minimize your, your logic. That, that's another. Uh, practical use of the, the don't care. <clears throat> okay, for the Mealy machine, uh, we only needed two states. 
and uh, but you build it the same way. The only difference here is notice how they combined the outputs into the next state. Now this is a little misleading because the output logic and the next state logic for a Mealy machine are two sort of conceptually separate you know, tables. But because the output logic uses the same set of inputs as the next state, right? because it uses the current state and the inputs, they just added it to the same table. right? Everyone with me? OK. And so uh, they, they have the more. Uh, the more uh, next state is here. It turns out that it's pretty simple. It's just um, A and S0 gives you S next state of S1 and not, not A uh, gives you the next state of S0. Everyone see that? So you're going to need to be sure that you can, you can build one of these um, you know, state machines with, um, you know, from, from the, from the, the state, um, the, state uh, the uh, graph topology. Any questions? Uh, well, one, so it's, it's, you have the table, so the, the idea is that once you have this table, then you're applying the same stuff that we learned in chapter two. This is just combinational logic. This is just a, a, a truth table that you could use to build up your, you know, sum of products or product of sums, or you could put this into a Carnot map and, and use it to minimize. Um, the only... The only, the only difference, well, there is really no difference between this and what we did last chapter, except that the output of this truth table is going to the input of this register, and the input of the truth table is coming from the output. So you have this design looks a little funny because it's this, it looks like it has a cycle in it. It's like, what's going on? You got to, what is this, a cross-coupled? You know, no, it's, it, this is just the implementation of a table. The only complicated part about this, and it's, 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 you know, it's not really complicated, it's just kind of confusing, is that your outputs are going to be connected to the inputs of this register, this flip-flop, and the inputs of these gates are c coming from the output. So it looks like there's a cycle, but there's not a combinational cycle. It is a sequential, there, you've got this register that breaks the cycle into, breaks it up, right? So this is a valid sequential logic circuit. Normally in combinational logic you can't have cycles, but if you break those cycles up with a register then it just becomes a sequential logic circuit. Okay, I think I get it. Right? Sense? Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so this is the timing diagram. They show both the, the, the Moore and the Mealy machine. So uh, how, how would we read this? Um, a is the input, that's what the snail sees as it crawls along the tape. Um, our reset, now notice here too, um, I don't know if I pointed this out last time, notice this reset is like a pulse. It's sort of, the way reset works is you, you, you trigger a reset pulse at the beginning and then from that point on it's just dead. Like for the entire time you operate this circuit, generally speaking resets only use kind of like when you turn the thing on, when you turn on the device. Um, in computers, they literally wire the reset to the button on the computer, the reset button on the computer. It's, 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 it's a connection, right, that between the button and the input to the, uh, all the registers on the, well, to the reset input on the processor, which is then connected to all the, uh, all the registers, all the flip-flops. You guys with me? So you, this is very common. You see this reset pulse at the beginning. What generates that pulse? It's generally ge generated by someone hitting a button. I know that sounds weird, but that's 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 literally how to do it. There's, um, it's it's. I don't know how else to do it. Actually, every FPGA board I've ever had, every circuit I've ever designed had some button that's connected. When I taught the the old version of this class, when we used the FPGAs, we literally had a button on the FPGA board that we would connect reset to. Um, so you need that button to to give that initial sort of sanity check. Um, another way to do it possibly is. If you don't have a button, you could like say when you plug the device in, you could have it like charge a capacitor somehow, but then it would have to be disconnected. I'm not sure exactly how that. Anyway, so it's a pulse, resets everything. Um, this reset happens to be a is this synchronous or re asynchronous? Uh, 
Uh, looks like it's um, it looks like it's asynchronous because notice how the reset goes high, sort of in the middle of cycle one, and the S, which is our state, our current state, it gets it goes from uh -huh to S zero before the rising clock edge, right? So that means it's an asynchronous reset. If it was a synchronous, if it was synchronous, it, this this change from I don't know to S zero would have happened on this dotted line or slightly after that dotted line, right? So it's an asynchronous reset. Now once we reset, then we see, okay, I start out in S0, and then I see a 0, 1. 0, 1 is what's supposed to make, um, 0, 1, let's see, how's that work? I go from 0, 1, so I go from state 0, state 1, state 2. Oh, it's 1, is it 1? Oh, yeah, 0, well, yeah, sorry, sorry. 0, 1, and then I get to the smile. Right now, the, the thing, the reason I hesitated there was because notice how I get the zero here, I get the one here, but look at this weird delay, right? There's a delay. I mean, the snail sees zero and one. The snail's supposed to smile, and it does, but it takes it a whole clock cycle. Notice that? So it's almost like a delayed reaction, right? But that's intentional. That's how the, that's how it's designed because. The, it takes a cycle to go into the accepting state, you know, the, the, the state where, where he smiles. Um, <clears throat> make sense there? You see that? Now that's on the Moore machine. Now if you go to the Mealy machine, there's a difference. Now the Y, the smiling, is actually happening one cycle earlier, right? Now why is that? Well, the Mealy machine doesn't have to wait that cycle to get to the accepting state because it's Mealy machine. And the, because the output is a function of the input in the current state, it can respond asynchronously, right? So it can happen right away. It doesn't have to wait for, um, it doesn't have to wait for a cycle to get into that accepting state. You guys with me on that? Okay. What happens after that, by the way? 0, 1, 0, 0, I stay in 0. Then I get the 1 here. So naturally, I have a 0, 1. I got the delayed reaction there. I got the early 1 here, and then and so on and so forth. OK. OK, the, um, now one of the things you can do with, with um, when you're designing large state machines sometimes is you can factor them. You can break, you can break them apart into um, uh, multiple uh, smaller state machines that interact. The problem with this is it's a little, it's, it's kind of tricky because uh, there's not a really good methodology for this. Uh, in this case, they say, what happens if we have, we go back to the traffic light example, but we add another two inputs. One is called P, parade mode, and the other one's uh, R, which means leave parade mode. Um, I don't know why they just didn't use, they could have just used one bit for that. You know, when P is 1, I want to enter parade mode. When P is 0, I want to leave it. Uh, but they have two separate signals. One says go into parade mode, and the other one says leave parade mode. And um, if you go into parade mode, then Bravado Boulevard light stays green, right? That's the north-south. Now, that seems pretty straightforward, right? What's the big deal? Well, the problem is, is that it complicates the state machine, turns it into this. And the reason for that is because if I want to go into par parade mode, I don't want to immediately change the state. I want to, I want to be a little bit more savvy about this. If, if, I'm, if, I've, if, I've got tra if I've got a green light on Academic Boulevard and I go into parade mode, I can't instantaneously change the Bravado Boulevard light to green, it'll cause an accident. Instead, you have to have the state machine acknowledge that it saw it, the requests for parade mode, but it's got to still wait to switch to parade mode until the traffic lets up on Academic Boulevard. It can't just do it instantaneously. So what they ended up doing is they had a, a, a four new states that represent sort of the states that you go into once you acknowledge the parade mode. 
So for example, if I'm over here in S0, I've got a green light on academic. If I'm being told that I want to go into parade mode, um, then you still have to wait for the, the traffic to finish. Uh, so they have this transition from this S0 to S4 that says, if I want parade mode and there's no traffic on academic, then I'll go into, into this uh, state. Was it this one? Uh, da, 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 da. Yes, right. Um, that's kind of interesting, though, because they could have went directly. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. It is this one. Yeah, sorry. I was looking. Yes, thank you. Sorry, sorry. Yes, I, I didn't follow the line correctly. There's a lot of lines. Yes, it's the top line, right? So I would go immediately to here, right? So I would say, I'm going to go into parade mode. There's no traffic on academic, so I'm going to go, I'm going to start, I'm going to set the yellow light on, on, on uh, academic, right? If I have traffic on academic, then I come here. Because the idea is, is that, th the idea behind this is that if, if, if someone requests parade mode, they're only going to request it for one cycle, right? So I want to be able to catch the request for parade mode and come here, that way I can, I can, I can be in a state where I'm waiting for the traffic to let up on academic while having acknowledged that I want to eventually go into parade mode as soon as the traffic lets up, right? In which case I would come here, right? And then I'd go to, I would go to yellow and then red. And then once I check, once I get to this green light on bravado, I'm going to stay there forever until I leave parade mode. Right, until I get an R signal. You guys with me? So what do these states represent conceptually? These four are normal operation. These four are the operation that I go into if I've acknowledged parade mode, but I haven't gone into it yet, or um, I'm in parade mode, right? So I have, I have eight states in total. Yes? Are you talking like an actual parade? Yeah, like, I, like, like we're going to start a parade, so we're going to lock down academic. Academic will be red forever, right? Okay. Um, now here's the part of this that I don't get. <laughs> this state. <coughs> this state has no incoming transitions into it, right? If you have no incoming transitions into your state, you can never get into that state, right? Right? So there's no way to get to this state. If, if it's not a reset state, and there's no incoming transitions, there's no way to get to it, right? But the reason they put that there is because they wanted to show that um, you can break this into two separate state machines where one state machine controls the acknowledgement of parade mode. So once, you, once the user requests parade, the idea being that you can't count on the user to hold parade mode input the whole time there's a parade. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blip. If I get a blip of the parade mode input, I want to switch to this state, which is kind of a permanent semi-permanent, you know, it, it switches my system into parade mode, at which point I output this signal called M, which is kind of a, it's kind of a, a toggle, right? Once you say I want to go into parade mode, it's going to set this M to 1, it'll hold that M, at which point the M will feed back into this guy, and I could then use that to, uh, to say, over here, to say that if I have an M or traffic on B, then I'm going to stay in this state. So it allows me to essentially consolidate this down into the original four states with this added M value. You guys with me? Make sense? So two, two state machines. One is controlling the light. The other one's controlling uh, a registration of parade mode, essentially, is what this is. I'm registering it. I'm holding it. Uh, and then, of course, if I get an R, the R is a kind of a, like I said, it's like a blip. It's like a signal. It's like a pulse. And the R will allow me to go back and, and get out of that if I get an R. Make sense? Okay. Um, so uh, this is the design procedure. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of explained all this already, but through all these examples. So to sort of formalize this, um, when you're designing a state machine, I mean, the first thing you have to know is whether you need a state machine. So do I need to have memory? Well, that ha that's generally is, do, do I need to have some memory? Do I, uh, sorry, do I need to have, uh, is there a sequencing that has to happen? Um, 
Uh, do I have to follow? Do I need to? Do I need to be able to recognize patterns? Um, so once you once you've got that, you've got to identify your inputs and outputs. Uh, sketch the state transition diagram. Once you've got the transition diagram, you write the table. And as I mentioned, the table is 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 just it's it's just looking at the state transition diagram and essentially having one row for every for every arrow in the state transition diagram, right? Now the, there's a couple. There's that's not necessarily true because some arrows you don't put if they're implied. Like over here, you know, all of these states had a loop back that said stay in the state if I have zero 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 as my inputs, and so <clears throat> that loop back would have to be in the next state table, even though it's not shown in the diagram, right? But but you know, but so there's some hidden arrows that you may you may have to. Uh, Include, right? You guys with me? Uh, then you select your state encodings, which you could do that however you want. Um, I, I mentioned last time that if you choose state enco encodings poorly, uh, it may result in having it may result in your next state table requiring more gates than it may need to. So there's kind of these, you know, rules of thumb where you should use gray codes or one hot encoding, uh, but but not doing that won't won't prevent this from working at all. It's just that that's sort of a, an optimization for an area optimization. Uh, for more state machine, <clears throat> um, uh, you you have a separate you know output table uh, that's only a function of the, st the 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 state encodings and not of the inputs. And for Amelie. You kind of, they say write a combined state transition and output table. It doesn't have to be physically combined. But the point is, is that with a Mealy machine, your, your current state and your inputs um, uh, are, are considered uh, for the, when, when calculating the output. And then from there, you can write your Boolean equations, and then you can sketch the circuit schematic. So you know, the idea is that you start with this graph, which is some vertices and, and transitions, and you end up with logic gates and registers. Right? Okay, any questions about that? Everyone with me? Okay. Um, on the quiz, I had I had a I had one question on there where I I I give this to you in a reverse order. I give you the circuit schematic and then I ask what is the next state um, the next state um, Boolean, the next state uh, Boolean equation, Boolean expression for the next state function, and that's just a matter of going from gates to Boolean algebra. You know, kind of going the reverse, right? Okay. Um, okay. So the next part of this chapter talks about timing analysis. Uh, the problem is that. Um, you have to be careful with sequential logic circuits because um, when you have a clock edge, um, the way I think of these circuits, and th the way I explained it to you when we first started the, the chapter was, when you have a clock edge on a flip-flop, it sort of takes, it's like taking a snapshot of the input, right, and saving it, almost like taking a picture, right? Um, and the reason why we use edge triggered flip flops is because that the time in which the flip flop is looking at the input to sample it, to capture it, is really small. It has to do with the rise and fall time of the clock as opposed to the level of the clock. You guys with me? So the rise and fall of a clock is supposed to be pretty short compared to the clock period. You guys with me? Because if it wasn't, you'd have more of a, the clock would look more like a sawtooth, right? It would have these, you know, you, you want the clock, you know, normally when you think of the clock, you think of a clock that looks like, you know, it's high, low, high, low, high. You know, this, this time it takes a go, to transition is really, really small compared to the, the whole clock period, right? However, that's the way, you know, that's the way I always think of it. But 
it turns out that the, the time, the, there is a, a slightly longer amount of time before the clock edge and after the clock edge that you have to make sure that the input to the flip-flop is stable. That's called the aperture time, which is a great term because it, it's, again, it kind of relates back to the camera metaphor. Like if you have a camera, you take a, a snapshot, you take a picture, you open uh, the shutter, uh, and then you close the shutter really fast. And you take, a, you know, in the time that the shutter is open uh, is where you're recording the picture. And that's really, you know, it's, it's supposed to be a very short amount of time so you can freeze you know, you could freeze action, you can freeze a picture, right? So, um, but the, the actual amount of time that, um, uh, that you have to have the input stable is uh, a little bit longer than just the transition time. So there's the time before the transition called setup time and there's time after the transition called hold time. And you have to make sure that you keep the input to the flip-flop stable, when I say stable, I mean either a zero or one and not changing to zero or not changing to one during that aperture time. You guys with me? If you don't, it can lead to this condition called metastability in which the flip-flop could go into a state where it has a voltage inside of it captured that's in the forbidden zone. The forbidden zone is the zone that halfway between zero and one voltage wise, you don't know, you don't know what it is. Generally speaking, if you get into metastability, it's not, it's not catastrophic because the flip-flop will eventually go into a zero or one state, right? But it takes time. It increases the propagation delay of the flip-flop, right? So, the idea is that when you're designing circuits, um, anytime you design digital logic, it's it, inevitably you're going to have sequential logic in there. You can't design a chip with just all combinational logic. Every, every digital chip in the world has sequential logic, right? It's all clock-based. Everything is based on getting data out of registers or flip-flops and then into registers, creating these data paths, right? That You guys learned about that in 212, at least you should have. Um, so, but, but the problem is, is that you have to be careful that you don't have any data paths. You don't have any, these, these combinational paths between, between flip-flops that violate this aperture time. You have to make sure that all of the flip-flops in your system have data uh, stable before, within, before the, um, the time that's the setup time before the clock edge and it has to be stable the whole time after the clock edge. You guys with me? Does that make sense? I don't know if I, I, don't know if I explained that very well. But you have to, the, the idea is, is that the input, so this is the clock, and this is D, right? So if I change D right there, notice that D is changing just before the rising clock edge, which is when I want to capture D, which is fine. As long as that happens outside of the setup time, right? Now you might say, oh, wait a second, who would ever do that? Why, why? Well, remember that what determines this, where these clock edges are is the clock speed, right? And everyone wants to have the fastest clock speed possible, right? That way, when I sell my processor, I could say, I, this is, Intel just did this recently. It was, they had a, what was it, the i9? They had a five gigahertz. They said, this is the first five gigahertz. And it turned out that they had to liquid cool it or something to make that happen. But anyway, you want to have the fastest clock speed, right? The problem is, is that you can't violate these timing constraints. You have to make sure that you can increase your clock rate, but only to the point where you make sure that all the data arrives at your registers before the setup time and is held steady after the hold time. You guys with me? So this is timing analysis. This is the way to basically ensure, this is what tells you what clock speed your circuit runs at, essentially, is what I'm trying to say. You build a chip, so your Intel, you build a chip, and it's like, how fast does that chip run? Clock, what's the clock speed? How fast can I run the clock? 
Well, it depends on this timing analysis. This is what determines how fast your CPU runs, you know, in terms of the clock speed. There's other things that impact the overall performance, but the clock speed is determined by this timing analysis. Okay, oh, yeah, sorry, I have a, forgot I have a pic nice picture of this here. So there's the clock edge. Um, if the clock edge happens here, the data, D, that's the input to the register, it has to be, it can do whatever it wants, but it's gotta be, it's gotta make up its mind and be stable by this setup time, and it has to remain stable uh, for the hold time. And then this, this time, the setup plus hold is the aperture time, right? The aperture time is the time around the clock edge. Um, you don't really see aperture time very often though because generally speaking the setup and the hold time are different. So it's not like it's, it's not like the aperture is centered exactly on the transition. <clears throat> Any questions? Okay. Okay, so uh, what does that mean for us? Um, how do we do this analysis? Well, we talked about propagation delay and contamination delay already in the last chapter with regards to combinational logic circuits, uh, combinational logic. So if you build a combinational logic circuit, it will have a propagation delay and a contamination delay. You can calculate that uh, by tracing every possible path through the circuit. So from all the inputs to all the outputs, you're going to have a propagation delay, which is the maximum time it takes to the maximum propagation delay of all the gates along a path, right? That's the critical path, right? The longest path through a circuit. Now remember, remember I mentioned to you that if you, if you had just taken 211, you would be saying, wait a second, the, the path through a circuit is always two <coughs> gates. I always go through two levels of gates. You go through an AND gate and you go through an OR gate, done. Every Carnot map gives you that, every midterm, you know, sum of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, sum of products is, is two levels of gates. But of course, that in reality, that's not how it works. Generally speaking, your, your paths are unbalanced. You have different, you have long paths to a circuit and you have short paths to a circuit. You generally don't build everything as a two level logic circuit, right? It's not practical because you'd end up having to have huge gates to do that with lots of inputs. You guys with me? Okay, so the propagation delay is the longest amount of time through the circuit. The contamination delay is the shortest time through the circuit with respect to the contamination delay of individual gates. So the contamination delay is when, if you change the input to a gate, what is the earliest time that something could happen on the output of that gate? Right? Um, so that's when, when, when the output starts to change is determined by the contamination delay and the propagation delay is when it, when it finally settles, right? What is this all determined by, by the way? Well, it happens, it's, it's, it, it comes down to the analog uh, circuits that make up the gates, the capacitance and the resistance internally inside the gates. Uh, it, also ha ha it also has to do with the transistors, too, and the way that the transistors behave and how, how the transistors switch. Um, contamination delay, um, is, is partly attributed to the fact that NMOS transistors and PMOS transistors operate at different speeds. PMOSs switch slower than NMOSs. That's why you know, PMOSs are, are slower than NMOSs. Uh, why? It's semiconductor physics. Um, it has to do with the materials. So um, anyway, um, so what are we getting at here? Where, where do you think this is going? Well, where it's going is, is that the propagation delay is going to be useful for making sure that your data path from flip-flop to flip-flop obeys the setup time, right? And the contamination delay ensures that or determines whether it's going to meet your hold time, right? Which I'll get to here in a second. The first thing though is the, the flip-flops also have a propagation and contamination delay. So in addition to individual gates having a contamination propagation, you also have them for the flip-flop, the, the memory elements, right? Um, the problem is I don't really understand the notation, T, P, C, Q. I get the P is propagation delay, right? T, P, that's what we used last chapter, T, P. C, Q? I, I don't know where that comes from. I don't know what the C and the Q, that's just confusing. Clock, clock you think? Clock Q? It could be. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe the C is clock. Uh, 
don't know. I don't like when these things start to get long. <laughs> these these symbols, because I'll never. I, I have a hard time remembering it. TP TPCQ is the nothing more than just the propagation delay of the Q. Yeah, that's right. Well, Q is the Q from the, I guess from the flip flop. But this is the this is how fast the flip flop switches once I record a new, once I register a new value in it. Right. The contamination delay is TCCQ, is um, the time that, that, that the Q might start to be unstable after my clock edge, right? So it's the same thing as we did last chapter with regard to the gates. You have these same two uh, terms that apply to flip-flops or registers as well. So this idea of dynamic discipline is, um, dynamic discipline means we need to ensure when we design a circuit and we determine what the clock rate is for that circuit, because with sequential logic, you have to pick a clock rate now. We, you know, so far, we've talked about the behavior of the clock and what it does. But now we're getting into how fast can I run this thing? How fast can I crank up the clock speed? Because you want, you know, generally speaking, if it's a processor, you want the clock to run as fast as possible, right? Right? Now, by the way, this also answers other questions. For example, like when I was in high school in college, there was a megahertz war. I don't know if you ever heard of this. The megahertz, oh, well, that was huge. That was, just, that was, that was a big deal. So Apple, so there was Apple, and there was, in, there was Apple and, and uh, Microsoft machines, right? So Apple machines, Apple computers, did not use an Intel processor. They used a Motorola PowerPC chip. And they did for the entire history of Apple computer, all going all the way back, they always used Motorola chips. I don't, Motorola, God, are they even in business? Yeah, I guess so, sort of. <laughs> Motorola used to be huge. That was a big deal in the semiconductor industry. They made all the Apple processors. And um, Intel made the processors that ran Windows machines. And so, the problem is, is that Apple would come out and say, we have a faster computer. And Intel would say, come out and say, I don't know how you can say that because ours run at 800 megahertz and yours runs at 400 megahertz. So <laughs> that's, that claim is ridiculous. There's no way an Apple could be faster. Um, and then Intel started deliberately designing their processors to have an increasingly faster and faster and faster clock rate. And it got to all the way to damn near 5 gigahertz by 1999. And they did that because they were, they were, they were, they had this architecture that they called a microburst, uh, sorry, uh, microburst? What was the name of their architecture? The Pentium 4 architecture was called the micro, I think it was called the, yeah, the microburst. And the idea was is that they kept pipelining it, deeper and deeper pipelines, so they could run the clock faster and faster. And the only reason they're, one of the main reasons they were doing that is so they could, they could use that as a marketing tactic to sell more IBM PCs than, than Apple, right? That was a big deal. Uh, the problem is, is that it was completely fallacious because Intel processors and Motorola processors had different instruction sets. And so when it comes down to how fast a computer is, the clock speed is a part of that equation, but it's not the whole thing. It's the clock speed, but you have to multiply it by the number of instructions and the number of cycles per instruction, right? So when, when this megahertz war was going on, it ignored the fact that the number of instructions you had to execute to run the same program on a, on a, on a Motorola processor might have been less. Not, and the number of cycles per instruction might have been less. So even though the clock rate was less, it might have been a faster computer, right? That was the, pro that was the, that was the megahertz war. Well, anyway, what happened was is that Intel kept doing this, and eventually they ran into a brick wall because they made, them, they made these things real fast, and then they had to back off because the, the, the reason why the clock was so fast is because they had a deep pipeline, but the deep pipeline was devastating if you got a branch misprediction. You would have to flush the whole pipeline, and then you'd have to, you would lose the advantage of the high clock speed. And then, so they, they went back to the old architecture, the Pentium 3 architecture, and then they, they carried that up all, all the way until today. 
But even, th even with that and all the, enhance all, the, all the stuff going on with semiconductor technology and Moore's Law and shrinking feature sizes, they never got above 4 gigahertz. And to this day, they still are kind of messing with us because they had this big thing in the news where they came out with this I-9 extreme Pentium thing, and they said that it was the first 5 gigahertz, and it turned out to be um, sort of a, uh, they faked it because they had to liquid cool it with liquid nitrogen to get it to run that fast, but they didn't tell anyone that. Uh, was that the story? That was the story, right? Yeah, so, so anyway, what's the point of all this? The point is we can't run the clocks faster. Why? Well, it's power, right, part of it. And the other reason is, is that it depends on how much logic you want to squeeze into a clock cycle. If you keep increasing the clock, you have to decrease the amount of logic in order to not violate these setup and hold times. And, and thus, you end up with uh, very little amount of work being done every clock cycle. Right? So it's, it, there's, this, there's this sort of ideal point. And so, it, 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 so in the end, we're, we're sort of stuck at five, you know, less than 5 gigahertz. OK, so um, sorry, I went off on a tangent there a little bit. Um, so, um, OK, so anyway, so how do we determine all this, by the way? So, um, uh, so we have a clock. We have a register. Everything in a CPU is register, logic, register. Everything works that way. Every instruction is implemented by a series of these data paths, register, logic, register. And so the problem is, though, is that this first register, which is providing the source for the data path for the combination logic circuit, it has a propagation delay and a contamination delay. The logic in between also has a propagation delay and a contamination delay. And we have to make sure that this data arrives into this register, the input to this register, uh, by the time in order to, it has to, it has to arrive before the setup time requirement, and it has to stay stable for after the hold time requirement, right? So you have to, and, 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 and by the way, the cycle time is TC, it's, it's, the clock, it's the clock period, it's the reciprocal of the, of the clock uh, frequency. So if the clock frequency is 4 gigahertz, that would mean that you have 1 over 4 billion, which is 250 picoseconds, 250, uh, Trillionths? Trillionths of a second. 250 tri trillionths of a second. 250 picoseconds is your TC. That's, that, that's the budget you have for this stuff between these two registers. But you have to include the combination logic and the impact of the registers themselves. So what that means is, is that your TC, which is the clock period, has to be greater than or equal to the propagation delay of the first register, this guy, R1. That's that P. TPCQ, this is why I don't like all these letters, because this is going to turn into alphabet soup. But then you add PD, propagation delay of the logic, right? And then you have to add the setup time, which is the margin that you have to give this register. So it's really just three parts. Propagation delay of this guy, propagation delay of this guy, setup time of this guy. You add them all together, and that has to be less than or equal to the clock period. Right? Now remember that propagation delay for the combination of logic is the longest path. Right? We, we, we had that question on the test about that. So that's kind of the worst case delay through the combination of logic. Um, the the um, so the propagation delay of your logic, this is just the same thing written another way, has to be less than or equal to the clock period minus the propagation delay of the register and the setup. Now, why do they, why do they write it like this? Well, because this is basically technology, is, is part of your technology library. This is part of your, this, is, this TPCQ is something you can't change as a designer. That's part of the, that's part of the, the technology. That's part of the chip fabrication technology. This is what you get from the fab when you want to make a chip. Same thing with this, the setup time, right? This comes from the, the well, it's the, the semiconductor technology and the standard cell library, whoever designed the, the, the actual flip-flops. Um, and then, so what would you do? Generally, you've got, you've got two things you can control. You can control the propagation delay of the combinational logic, because you as a designer are building that. And you can control the, the clock, right?
But generally speaking, you pick the clock first. So that's why the clock is on the right-hand side of this inequality. So these two are given. This you pick as your target clock rate, well, clock period, which is the reciprocal of the rate. And then this then will determine your timing requirement. This is a constraint. So when you use synthesis tools, when you synthesize your logic, CAD tools have something called timing constraints. This is a timing constraint. You have to obey this constraint. And then there's a timing analysis is done when you try to compile your design. So when you compile your design, it might say, can't do it. Sorry. I can't meet timing. If it tells you that, then that means you've got to go back to your design and you've got to change your design to reduce the propagation delay of your critical path. Or you can change your constraint. You can say, well, I'll slow down the clock a little bit and try again. You guys with me? Does that make sense? This is, by the way, this stuff is, if you go into a job where you do any hardware design, you will be using this stuff. This is, this is probably the most practical thing that we've covered so far in the class, this, this timing analysis. This is, this is endless when you do logic design. This is a huge part of your job as a, hard, as a, as a, as a digital design engineer is dealing with this. So. Um, I want to emphasize that, that this is something that will come up endlessly if you, if you actually get a job doing this stuff. Okay, um, I guess I'm out of time. I'll see you on uh, Monday. Don't forget to take the quiz.